a great privilege for me to stand before you today and present a lesson from the Word of God. Appreciate the invitation to the lectureship here. I had to miss one year. I know I was overseas, but for the last uh, six years or so, I've been coming down here and getting an opportunity to uh, visit with the brethren here and to speak on the lectureship, and I appreciate that opportunity. As Riley mentioned, I've been doing mission work since 1982, and I was one of a group of men to go to Taiwan and begin to work among the Chinese people to try to, try to prepare for the time when we'd be able to send people into mainland China to preach the gospel. I am thankful to say that we do have gospel preachers now living in mainland China who are native mainland Chinese. Uh, we still have uh, brethren in Taiwan who are working among the people there. You know, there are more than 23 million people living in Taiwan and just a handful of churches. And so there's still so much to do. When I leave here next week, on the 5th of November, I'll be going back to Indonesia to teach two weeks in the Southern Sumatra Bible Academy. And then my wife and I, and actually my two stepdaughters, will go to Singapore for the Forsyth College Lectures. We'll be there for nine days. And then the girls will go back to Indonesia. My wife and I have wanted to uh, Taiwan. We'll be there for two and a half weeks. And I'll be teaching, uh, speaking a lectureship. And of course, everything I do in Taiwan is in Chinese. And so, the fact that I'm able to speak in the Mandarin uh, makes it a lot easier. I don't have to worry about a translator. Although I am now doing some teaching in Indonesia, and I do need a translator there, because I do not yet speak uh, Indonesian. Uh, I never dreamed I'd be learning a third language in my lifetime, but here I am learning a third language, because my wife, even though she's fluent in English, she also speaks Indonesian, so I'm trying to learn that. And the last Sunday in December, because I, I set a goal uh, before the end of the year, I'm going to preach a sermon in, in Indonesia. And so the last Sunday of the year was the latest I could do it. <laughs> Still keep the goal. <laughs> and so, so I'm going to be working on that when I go back this time. And, uh, I'll basically be reading the sermon, but at the same time, uh, I'll be presenting it in, uh, in Indonesia. And in the future, I hope to continue to work on that third language. But today we're going to speak in my first language, and that is English. So I'll do the very best I can in that area. We're talking about Zechariah today, uh, the next to the last prophet of the minor prophets in our series. And we're beginning in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. In Acts chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, Peter is preaching that second sermon after the dead Pentecost, and he says in verse 22 beginning, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass, that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Verse 24, yea, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. And so Peter quotes Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 18. And then Peter adds that not only were the prophecies of Moses, but all of the prophets that followed after would be speaking of the coming Messiah. And certainly when we look at God's plan for saving mankind, we know that before the foundation of the world, God had already planned to send the Messiah into the world to shed his blood on the cross so that we might have the opportunity to have our sins washed away. And so in the Garden of Eden and the events that took place there, we know that God already had a plan in place. And we read of that great promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, restated in the 15th and 18th chapters of the book of Genesis, talking about that in his seed, all families or all nations of the earth would be blessed. That's the plan that God had. 
And so as we look at the events that take place in the Old Testament, we see the prophets of God who were forth telling God's word, because that's the meaning of the word prophet. They were forth telling, they were telling God's will for the people then. But they were also foretelling, telling of things that would take place in the future, which of course included the coming of Jesus to this earth, living a perfect life on this earth, giving us that perfect example that we are to follow. And then making that great sacrifice on the cross, shedding his blood in our place so that we might have the opportunity to be saved eternally. And so when we talk about the deity of Christ, we talk about all the different proofs that are available to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And one of those proofs is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And just like the other books in the Old Testament, Zechariah is no exception. There are prophecies in this book that are fulfilled in Christ. And Zechariah is one of those prophets mentioned by Peter in Acts 3 and verse 24. The name Zechariah means he whom the Lord remembers. He was born in exile and returned to Jerusalem from Babylon about 536 B.C. You'll remember about 536 B.C. is when Zerubbabel led the first group of exiles back into Judea. He was a young man. In contrast to Haggai, according to Zechariah 2 and verse 4, and the date of this book is approximately 520 to 518 B.C. He was a prophet at the time, at the same time as Haggai. As the 5 verse 1 says, then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So he was working with, in, in, uh, in concert with Haggai to help get the Israelites to do what they were supposed to do back in 536 B.C. And that was to rebuild the temple. They had stopped doing that. And so because of that, both Haggai and Zechariah came to urge them to get back to business and to build the temple. Ezra 6 and verse 14. And the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Zechariah's theme is God's remembering love and providential care for his people. When we look at the Bible, the Bible is a book that talks about the providence of God. Now, there are a lot of miracles that are recorded in the Bible. But if you will know, many of the miracles that are performed in the Bible come in groups. They come in bunches. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of miracles when Israel is being delivered from Egypt. And all of those plagues were to prove to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, as well as to prove to Israel that God had sent Moses to lead them out of the land of bondage toward the promised land. And then when Elijah and Elisha came to prophesy, here are two prophets that did not write books, but they did perform miracles. And Elijah and Elisha both performed miracles. There was a bunch of miracles right there. For what purpose? To confirm that these two men were sent by God. And to confirm that their message came from God. 
And then, of course, we come down to the first century. There was a 400-year pe period between the book of Malachi and the coming of John the Baptist in the early parts of the gospel accounts. John the Baptist did not perform any miracles. But we know that when Jesus came, he began to perform miracles. And he gave the apostles the power and the ability to perform miracles. And so then, in that first century period, when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, until the final revelation of God is given through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we see a bunch of miracles that are performed to prove that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, to prove that the apostles were approved by God and were giving this new revelation different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament had already been written. It had already been confirmed. And so when we read of the miracles in the New Testament, we're not reading about miracles that were performed to confirm the Old Testament record, but a new revelation. And so we see it on the day of Pentecost when the apostles spoke in tongues to draw a crowd together so that Peter could preach that first sermon to them. And then those miracles continued to continue to confirm the words that the apostles and others were speaking. And so we recognize that miracles were performed, but all of the rest of the time in the Bible, we still see God's hand in the work that he was doing with his servants. And so we see the providential hand of God. And we could think of several examples. I'm sure you've already run a few ideas, a few examples through your mind of where God worked providentially. For example, Joseph, when he went into Egypt, God providentially cared for Joseph. We could think about Queen Esther and how God worked providentially through her life. And there are many others that we could mention. And then we learn from the book of Zechariah that God is jealous over them with great jealousy as Christ is over his church. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. When you read the Old Testament, you will get a clear picture of what God thinks about idolatry. We go back to, uh, we go back to Egypt again. And when the Israelites come out of Egypt, they had been influenced by the Egyptians and by their religion. And so we see Israel doing what Egypt did. And that is worship idols. And when they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, while Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments from God, they're down at the foot of the mountain having Aaron build them a, an idol so that they can worship that idol. And from that point, all the way through to Zechariah's day, all the way down to Babylonian exile, Israel had a problem with idolatry. And God hates idolatry. You look at the kind of attitude that God has towards idolatry in the Old Testament. And it will give you an idea of how God is a jealous God. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. And then when we see, and this is, just, this is just an aside here, if you will, when we see that Paul says that covetousness is idolatry in Colossians 3, verse 5, that tells us what God thinks about covetousness. We already know what he thinks about idolatry, and Paul equates that with covetousness. 
in the New Testament. The Messianic hope is the greatest assurance of God's love and provision for those who seek Him. The heart of Zechariah's prophecy was the coming of the Prince of Peace. A passage you will want to mark in your Bible is Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear his, the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace, shall be between them both. Now, this verse is a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. And it is a very significant, it is a very significant passage. Because it mentions that the Messiah would be both king and priest at the same time. Now, I have this later in my lesson, but I'm afraid I'm not going to get to it. So I'm going to go ahead and mention it now. By the time I get down to that particular uh, part of my lesson, that my time may have already run out. So I'm going to mention it now to make sure that we get it in because it's very important. Because the king would come through the line of David. You know, it was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, down to David, down to the time of Christ. The Messiah would be of the tribe of Judah and he would be a descendant of David and he would be king over his kingdom. But he could not be a king under the Mosaic law because this passage tells us he is also going to be a priest. And a priest under the Levitical law came from the tribe of Levi. So you couldn't come from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi at the same time. You either had to be of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Levi. Well, we know the Messiah was of the tribe of Judah. But he was going to be a priest. In fact, he is our great high priest, according to the recordings in the book of Hebrews. And so here is someone who is not going to be king and priest on the earth. He's going to be king and priest in heaven. And in order for that to happen, there has to be a change in the law. So it would no longer be the Mosaic law, but it would be the law of Christ. And so Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 is a very important passage because it talks about the coming Messiah. And so when we look at that verse, and then we look at some modern day religions or theories or isms. We read from many people that Christ is going to return when he comes back. He's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. The Bible doesn't teach that. And certainly, as we've already noted, that's not possible. Because Christ cannot be king and priest on earth at the same time. Then in the first six verses of the first chapter of Zechariah, Zechariah calls the Jews to repentance. And then his message is divided into two sections. The first, largely symbolic, has to do with the rebuilding of the temple. Chapter 1, verse 7 through chapter 8, verse 23. The second is prophetic concerning Judah's victory over neighboring nations and the coming of the Lord when all the earth will be transformed with all people worshiping the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 1 through chapter 14, verse 21. And so, in the first section, chapter 1, verse 7 through, six, through 8, chapter 6, verse 8, there are eight visions concerning the rebuilding of the temple by which God assures the Jews of his love and care and encourages them to overcome their complacency and to complete the temple. We know they already started it some 16, 18 years previously. 
but they had not completed the work. So in chapter 1, 7 through 17, we read of the rider on the red horse. The earth appears at rest, yet God's eyes are upon the nations in spite of the apparent stillness. The shaking of the nations were not, was not yet visible, but God had not forgotten his people. Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. He had heard their cry and will enable them to rebuild Jerusalem and will punish the heathen. The, heathen. the second vision are the four horns and the four carpenters or smiths in verses 18 through 21. God will break the power of Israel's oppressors. Horns are a symbol of power and here represent the rulers that scattered Judah. The carpenters symbolize the destruction of these powers. The third vision is the man with the measuring line, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The Lord stopped the young man from laying out the walls of the city. Jerusalem was to be a city without walls. The Lord would be Jerusalem's protection with a wall of fire about her, verse 5. And it would be the apple of his eye, verse 8. The fourth vision is of Joshua, the high priest, who appears in filthy garments in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Satan accuses Joshua, and the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, verse 2. The Lord orders, orders those before Joshua to replace the filthy garments with clean clothes, signifying that the priesthood should be cleansed, forgiven, and made acceptable for service. A changed priesthood would become perpetual in the person of my servant, the branch. Again, referencing the fact that the Messiah would be the high priest. Zechariah 3, verse 8, Isaiah 4, verse 2, and Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 4. The fifth vision is of the golden candlestick with seven lamps and two olive trees. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. The seven lamps of the candlestick represent the word of the Lord. The two anointed ones may be referring to Zerubbabel and Joshua, the civil and religious leaders who are given assurance that the temple will be rebuilt. This could come to pass only with the help of God, for we know that man's works of, on his own are not sufficient. But God's will must prevail. Zechariah 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Think back to, again, in the Bible, all of the examples where God made sure that the people knew that what was being done was being done by his power, and not by man's power. Think about the conquering of the city of Jericho. What did they do to get those walls to fall down? Well, they marched around the city 13 times. They blew the trumpets and they shouted and the walls fell. They didn't have to use dynamite. They didn't have to build tunnels under the wall. God caused the walls to fall down after they were compassed about seven days. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30. And then you remember when Gideon is going against the Midianites and he calls all the Israelites to come and help him to fight against the Midianites and 32,000 men come to fight. God says, it's too many. You've got too many men. So here's what you do. Send everybody home that is afraid, got something else to do, you know, got to mow the grass or fix the car. Send them home. And 22,000 men go home. Leaving 10,000. Well, God said, that's still too many. And so he sets up the test for drinking the water, and 300 men are selected. God used 300 men to show Gideon and the Israelites that they were not the ones defeating Midian. God was the one defeating Midian. And we see that time and time and time again. The sixth vision is the flying roll or scroll in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. I'll never forget 
The first time I went to Lambert's Cafe, some of you have probably been there, there's a couple of Lambert's Cafes in Missouri and one in Alabama. And uh, if you've been there, you know they throw the rolls at you. Uh, if you want a roll, who wants a roll? I do. Okay, there's, they're standing over there by Jonathan. Okay, here you go. And they throw it. And you catch it. And these rolls are about this big. And they're the best rolls I've ever eaten in my life. But anyway, if you drop one, if you, you know, the better than Ryan's, you know, where Ryan's used to be around. A lot better than Ryan's. But anyway, if you drop one, no big deal. They'll throw you another one. Well, the first time I got in line to eat at Lambert's, there was a, there was a, a scripture on the wall, and it was Zechariah 5, 1 through 4, which mentions the flying roll. And so they've got flying rolls at Lambert's Cafe. But it's not this flying roll that we're talking about. The vision answers the question, how will crime be removed? The scroll flies over the land, and its curse destroys the houses of those who steal or who swear falsely. That kind of reminds you of the destroyer that came to Egypt on the Passover. And he came to destroy the firstborn of every family unless he saw the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels. The seventh vision of, is of the woman sitting in an ephod. This too shows God's condemnation of wickedness among his people. The woman represents wickedness. She is born in a large dry measure to Shinar. With the temple rebuilt, evil will be removed from the land. And then the last vision is the four chariots and two mountains. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. The four chariots from between the brass mountains go forth to patrol the earth. Under God's protecting providence, the four spirits of the heavens bring peace to the four corners of the earth. And then we talk about the rest of the book. The last part of the sixth chapter describes the symbolic crowning of Joshua as the prophet looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, our high priest. Zechariah 6, verses 9 through 15. In chapter 7 and 8, Zechariah gives a fourfold answer to the questions concerning certain fasts. For 70 years, the people had observed days of fasting in remembrance of the fall of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. Now they had returned from exile. Should these fasts be continued? Zechariah answered, chapter 7, verses 4 through 7. They should discover their purpose for fasting and remember the former years. Chapter 7, verses 8 through 14. The Lord requires inward righteousness and not mere outward forms. Now that's an important point. Because throughout the history of the Bible, you know, the, the Israelites would say, we're circumcised, so we're God's people. We don't have to worry about what we do. And God says, what I want you to do is I want you to, I want your heart to be circumcised. Your heart needs to be right. Not just the outward, but the inward. And so here is also that emphasis. And then chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, God will restore to his people what they had lost. The fast will be turned into feasts of gladness. In the second division, chapter 9, verse 1 through 14, 21, there are two burdens or prophetic messages. The first is divine assurance that Israel will be united, reunited, and restored. Let me just say a word about that. Remember back in 1 Kings 12, when Jeroboam took the ten tribes off and began the northern kingdom. The Bible tells us at that time, when Jeroboam did that, the faithful Israelites in those ten northern tribes migrated to the south. And so there were all twelve tribes present in Judah long before Babylonian exile. And so when they come back from Babylonian exile, and Ezra is reading the law, the Bible says that 
all 12 tribes were represented. That's true. Because every representative of every tribe had moved south during the period of time when Jeroboam was leading the northern kingdom away from God. And so they would once again be reunited and restored. In the second burden, God promises that their enemies will be overthrown. Living waters will go forth from Jerusalem. The Lord will become universal.